Ignite your curiosity with Austin next. We're watching Austin transform from a thriving ecosystem into a global superstar. With our host, Jason Scharf, we aspire to better comprehend the true nature of innovation. Together, we will uncover what makes a successful ecosystem and navigate the technologies shaping our future. Now let's dive into what's next. There is a debate raging on how teachers, students, parents, and administrators should be thinking about AI in education. Should it be banned? Do we go all in? How do we balance the potential of this rapidly advancing technology with the needs of the students? My guests today have decided to take the embrace it approach and start incorporating AI right here in Austin at Lee Lewis Campbell Elementary. We discuss why they have embarked on this path, what it means for the school, and why Austin is becoming such a hub for education experimentation. Principal Keith Moore is a native Austinite who grew up on the east side of Austin. A product of the Austin Independent School District, he attended Keeling Magnet School and McCallum High School. He is a proud graduate of Houston Tillotson University, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies with a concentration in English. After teaching in high needs, Title I campuses for nine years, Moore completed graduate school in 2009 as a member of the cohort of the principalship program at the University of Texas at Austin. Mr. Moore worked as an assistant principal at Cook Elementary for three years. Next, he served in the associate superintendent's office as an administrative supervisor for 24 Austin Elementary and Middle Schools before becoming principal of Lee Lewis Campbell Elementary. Jules Beasley is director of Creative Action's Spark Schools program at Lee Lewis Campbell Media and Performing Arts Institute in East Austin. Spark Schools aims to help scholars learn core academic content, practice SEL skills, and express themselves through digital media and theater arts. Mr. Beasley has a background working as an editor in film and television, most notably on the Star Wars, the Clone Wars animated series. As an educator in New York City, he led hands-on critical media literacy education programs and earned his master's in childhood education at Hunter College in 2014. I hope you enjoy the episode. Keith Jules, welcome to the Austin Next Podcast. Hey, thanks. Hello. So why don't we start off by kind of giving a brief introduction of each of you and kind of where you're at now. So uh, Keith, do you want to start with you? Certainly. Right now, I am currently the principal at Lee Lewis Campbell Elementary Media and Performing Arts Institute. I've been here for approximately 10 years uh, today and just excited to be articulating our learning with scholars through uh, arts integration uh, in partnership, which will connect to this next person's uh, intro. Hello. Yes, I'm Jules Beasley. I work with Creative Action. We're a community arts education organization here in Austin, Texas, and we have uh, been partnering with Lee Lewis Campbell Elementary Media and Performing Arts Institute since 2015. And we have here a in-school arts integration program called Spark Schools, and that is teaching academics through the arts, through theater arts and digital media arts. So all the scholars have theater arts classes and digital media arts classes over the school year uh, during the school day. So to start off, maybe Keith, with you, tell me a little bit about then what is, you know, what is Campbell? What's the philosophy? Who is it that's attending? And I want to pull one thread that Jules said, because you said digital arts. And I think in today's environment, that's a really wide berth. So how are we defining digital arts? Your theater is a little easier to wrap my head around. So uh, with regard to um, our scholars, they are doing the regular Texas curriculum, uh, you know, uh, but we are connecting what they need to know in a different way. So as opposed to just giving a million worksheets and that sort of thing, the kind of drill and kill. We do a drill and thrill drill, where I the like scholars that. are then uh, oh, having the opportunity. Me too. They they have the opportunity to um, repeat uh, skills and and build on those skills through the arts and you know making things and and layering those you know opportunities to kind of reinforce the learning. 
And so then how are we defining, is it like the digital arts? In some cases, maybe what's the boundary of what's not included in that? I can speak to that. The So for example, this semester, third graders created science zines using the program I Adobe the Express. I zines in forever. Yeah, it's no. zines. They're still around. Hey, um, it is like paper with <laughs> little magazines. But um, they created each piece using Adobe Express. So they wrote it, put in the text, put in images, took photos, did some drawings, combined it all digitally, and created all these pieces for this science zine that we put all together. So we put everyone's work in the class together into these zines. And fourth grade did audiovisual poems. So they were using Adobe Spark and Adobe Express. We're using that a lot now to well, first they wrote their poems and then they recorded their voices, reading their poems, and then they added images to accompany their words. So they're creating videos. And then the fifth graders created sections, pieces of a science show talking about light, energy, force, and motion. So this is tied to the curriculum. And um, they're explaining the science ideas and, dem- and doing little demonstrations, recording that and making it fun and bringing their personalities to it to create this science show. So those are some great examples. And so how long is this, before we jump into kind of the, the center thesis of the episode about kind of AI in the classroom, how long is this kind of relationship been going on? How long we if, has Campbell been thinking about the arts as kind of in the digital medium? Is it been since you've been there? Is it an evolution of this? Like, how has that been going? So I definitely, I think uh, Mr. Beasley mentioned in the beginning, well, so I got here uh, 2014 and we connected because geographically the, their organization was very nearby in the neighborhood. And uh, just, you know, we had the same mindset, like children should be involved in the arts and it's for the greater good of the whole child. And so we've been partnering and each year strengthening that partnership since 2015. But is the, has the arts material always been kind of digital oriented or was it a lot, you know, back to kind of the very standard, like when I was a kid, like, you know, painting, sculpting, you know, the very more physical things? Yeah, I love that question. So there's been opportunities uh, to do basic art, you know, what you would say, the typical painting and doing those things. But then there's always the opportunity to kick that up to the next level, which is what we choose to do with all those things. So there are they're painting now they're doing these things, but they're also incorporating the, the, the digital part of that. So like he said, they may be making uh, taking digital photographs of these things, or they may be uh, creating some sort of learning experience that they can share, like teachable moments for others through digital media. So then now kind of circling into this, how did the idea of introducing AI tools into the classroom originate? Uh-huh. That is uh, Principal Moore with my beer taste and, and champagne well, I'm sorry, my champagne, it may be the other way around. Aha, you see that Freudian slip <laughs> with my with my champagne taste and, and Kool-Aid money because, you know, just wanting to always have more and more for them. You know, I know that creating access is where it's at. That's the access that, that helped me grow and become the person I am. And so I wanted to ensure that we had that here. Every year when there's something that's like the, you know, what's the next thing? What are people talking about? What are they doing? And so because we have a a unique and very special relationship, it's so comfortable for me to speak with uh, Mr. Beasley. You know, we still go by last names. You're calling me Keith and Jules. I've been Principal Moore and he's been Mr. Beasley. So you're weirding us out. But I go to to, to Mr. I I never know what to call my my teacher's kids either. I'm just like, well, you know, we kind of see each other, you know, in the community. So you're, you know, X, Y, Z person. But like when I'm I'm Principal Moore 24 seven. So it's okay Okay, if you stick with that one. But and so but Mr. Beasley. Principal Moore. Please don't send me to that. <laughs> You're in trouble now, buddy. So no, but um, it's so easy and comfortable to, to speak with uh, Mr. Beasley as our in-school coordinator uh, about co- um, connections that creative action can build upon. And so AI was this thing. I'm like, listen, we I'm seeing a lot of this. And, you know, every time you download an app, there's something in there about AI. We should be talking about this. And he was like, 
yeah, okay, here we go again. Here we do it. <laughs> but, he, but he was on the case, you know. <laughs> so so exciting to to be able to do that. Each year we're adding more and more of, of these types of uh, uh, relevant offerings. So one of the things is AI has been both exciting, and then there's obviously been both controversy around it in different ways, whether it be from the safety elements to the, are kids going to use it to cheat to just, when we talk about like, we're talking about the arc and how copyright fits into all of this. Has there been any particular challenges for you going from idea to implementation? Has there been any pushback at various levels? I'll say that I don't see a pushback. I think that in education, no matter where you are with technology, that you understand that there there has to be this commitment to growing scholars and and allowing them to see further than the horizon that that they may be looking at. So think jobs that that they're going to be applying for don't even exist yet. So we're if we're being responsible uh, educators, we have to take those opportunities to share that with them. And so for the most part, I think that's the energy that we receive. People are more surprised by, wow, y'all are offering that than they are saying, why are you doing it? And I think just having a healthy relationship with Creative Action through Mr. Beasley, uh, that we're able to talk about things like how will we address uh, digital citizenship and and responsibility as someone who's using this type of technology. And that's whole that and he he will totally elaborate on that even more. But I mean, that's kind of what our conversation was about as we decided to move forward in this direction. How are you thinking then about like? first principles and the things that you were teaching the kids, because it was really, it was, you said here, like the jobs that are going to be created for them, you know, in this case don't even exist yet, but the cycles are moving so fast. So the example I'm thinking of six months ago, we were saying, oh, prompt engineering is going to be this whole job that's been created by generative AI. And looking back now, six months later, like the idea of prompt engineering may be something that lasts like a year or two because of how fast the understanding of the AIs are getting and you can be a lot more just more natural language. So how do you think about the tool set you're teaching them versus this is how you should approach, almost at a fundamental level, this is how you should approach new technology and a growth mindset. So how are those kind of pieces coming together? Yeah. Jules, you want to say something about it? Well, you know, it occurred to me, you know, when, first of all, when Principal, asked, Principal Moore asked me to do this, I went, Oh, how what how am I gonna make this accessible to a third grader? Right? Because it's so complicated. But then I, I have a background in media literacy education. So I was like, okay, I know how to do media literacy education. I have lots of approaches for doing that, for doing it in hands-on ways, but also bringing in the critical component of understanding how things work by engaging in a process of media making or creation. Um, and so I thought, okay, we can use is we can use generative AI to create images and then look at those images and talk about them and, and see what comes out of that conversation. And in the process of doing that, I realized, well, if we're doing text to image, right? We're using text prompts. First of all, there's a natural literacy time. There. It's like, can you add more descriptive details to this sentence to create an image that's closer to, let's say, an image I give you? which is what we did. And so that got me to thinking about like the, you know, we may not need prompt engineers, but I bet you we're going to need prompt poets. Prompt Ooh, I artists. Like that. Prompt poets. And I think because there will be, I don't think that need for the artist, for the person who thinks as an artist using their imagination, but also able to translate that and using tools that are given that whatever tools we have at hand, I think there's still going to be a need for the creative artist using those tools. So I think whatever the job title is or um, whatever that looks like, I still think there's going to be a need for those people and they're not going to be completely replaced or eliminated. Although some jobs will be, for sure. And some artists will be struggling and they already are, right? So I was... I was thinking, I started thinking in those terms, like this is really kind of like writing a kind of poem. No, there was a great YouTube video, and it's a series called, uh, I think it's Huge If True. And there was an episode on 
you know, generative AI, especially in art, in the art world. And it, it really hit on what you just said, because I remember it was like, she brought on you know, the host and then she brought on an artist and they had the same concept. There's like, I think it was like a city in stained glass. And so they both did it themselves via like Adobe. Then they both used generative, you know, AI tools and then had everybody vote on it. And I hate, sorry, I'm going to spoil the episode. Everyone sees it, but it's still worth watching. Um, <laughs> so, you know, her stuff using the AI tools was voted higher than her not using it. But his stuff, the artist's work using the AI tools was better than all of hers because he brought in his particular creative mind and artistic skills and then was augmented by all of the different tools. So if you have, I mean, I always go back to that joke, which means it's an AI is not going to replace a human. The human using AI is the person that's going to take your job. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that. I was uh, listening, coming in this morning to an, on another platform and there was an, an artist and they were, they were talking about this artist who lost their voice and they can no longer sing. However, now this artist is coming out with an album where they will be using AI to make songs and to sing again. So I thought that was crazy. It's like right on time for today. And that was just this morning. Yeah. And then you've got some artists who are really thinking differently. I know I can't fully is, you know, Grimes, who I think also who does live here in Austin, or at least spends a lot of time here. She's developed kind of the AI Grimes and then people can act. She's actually licensing. And so people can create new grime songs using her voice. So it's just really kind of, rather than fighting with the, are you using my stuff? I'm going to sue you a copyright. Instead, she's like, no, 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 I'm going to use it. Let's all do this together and create really interesting new art. So there's the community aspect of it. That's a lot of fun. So walk me through a little bit. What exactly are, we talked a little bit about like, you know, using the, the image generators, but what are the programs? What are the tools that are being used in AI for the scholars? We just use the Adobe Firefly beta uh, generative AI tool. First of all, because it's it's, it's free and accessible to, to them, so they can access it through Adobe Express. So it's used. One of the reasons we're using that is that it's they can all log in and access it for free through the district uh, using accounts. So that made it easy to use. But I also really liked that. I like that compared with like Mid Journey that. It was, it's still in beta. So you get lots of weird things coming out of it. Like, you know, the, the hands with fingers coming out of their fingers and things like that. Yeah. And I think one scholar made a, made an image with it was a dad and a baby. And the, one of the, one of them had a the baby's face, had a man's face on, on the baby. And it, so it's like you out of that, you get some problems that come up and you start to wonder, well, what is this thing thinking to create this? So that can spark the conversation and the dialogue around uh, like one of the problems with the AI, uh, what are the problems that you're seeing with what's generated, but how did it also, how does it work? How is it creating these images? And so then that opened up a, a way to explain you know, very simply that they're using these large libraries of uh, images and they're kind of matching, matching them together, mixing them up in the way you'd make a collage or something. And you can really see that in that beta AI tool, whereas like mid journey, you might put something polished and finished and fine and it may be harder to see. So I chose, we, I chose to use that. And I think we'll probably use it in the future. Just in, I have some ideas. I think there still are a lot of interesting weirdness and artifacts going in. So I think by the time this airs, uh, it'll be after, but like my oldest who's in fourth grade is doing a science project to find, trying to figure out some of the weirdness in mid journey. And he's getting, we have been playing with it and he started to see different patterns based even, even in random prompts. And so he's going to, he's going through and trying to discern is, is, is there something actually going on underneath? So it's a, it's been a lot of fun watching him really get into all of the different AI tools. Yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it makes me wonder what, like, you know, it is, it's like a black box, right? We don't really know, especially, you know, if you're a young person and haven't read it. <laughs> and all these, all the writings of how it works, you don't know. So it does invite, you know, 
it calls on you to to infer and and make some educated guesses and analyze patterns like you're saying and try to figure out what's going on here. Um, so it does just as an object of inquiry. I think and something that I think we continue to kind of investigate and explore how they work, uh, as well as the ethical dimensions, the ethical issues are mm -hmm. use. Yeah. So. For some more, kind of, see, I can be taught. I can change. <laughs> the, when you think about your overarching goals for bringing this tool set into the school, like, yes. what are what are those goals, and how are you measuring their success? Love it. No, so the goal is consistent, and that is create access for scholars. And so we continue to measure that by the offerings that we're that we're uh, providing for scholars and on our campus they're not you know you don't get like little pieces well only these people are doing this or only these people almost everything age appropriately is offered for all scholars during the school day so you don't need to have a ride to get here you, if you can't stay after school you won't miss out you know there's none of that so if, if parents get you here to school you're able to receive all of this. And the, the purpose is just to create access. There are folks who, you know, come from different experiences. They have different family experiences. And so we want to make sure that with equity at the forefront, that we continue to have opportunity and ensure that those opportunities are taken advantage of by all scholars so that we learn from other scholars who may have had more of an, of an experience. Those other scholars who don't have that experience learn from it. And then scholars who, everybody has experienced something different. So there's not like a, oh, you went to this big thing and spent a lot of money and I didn't have a lot of money, but I learned from the thing that you did last night with, you know, grandma that, I don't have that culture in my house, so I'm learning this thing. And so this is just another way to continue with that goal of creating access. You know, these are tools that we're using, no matter what they are. We could, if they're taking digital pictures, if they're using AI, if they're recording music for music production, these are all ways that we're leveraging just tools that are available to them. And we're trying to keep the most current access of tools that are available so that we can continue to work. The work is teaching the scholars. These are just tools by which we're using to connect them to it and, and to actually uh, allow them to, to touch it and experience it because those things aren't going away. They're just coming so much faster. We're trying to, and we're not at a breakneck speed keeping up, but we're doing what we can. You know, We're doing as much as we're able to do to help. Well, and I think that's a perfect question then is you talk about like the current tools and the breakneck speed. I mean, we just barely passed the one year mark of ChatGPT. And so just the world is ca catching up and changing. And even in that time, right, it went multimodal. It had incorporated, Do you know, Dolly, like all this stuff is just moving at a crazy pace, which is both exciting. And then as someone trying to, I can imagine trying to create curriculum and incorporating it in, how on earth are you one? How are you trying to keep up and then trying to then integrate it down so that the kids understand that, oh, well, this week that tool you were using did these five things. Now it's doing these 30 things. And here's all this new stuff. And it's it's exciting and it's fun. But I can only imagine the difficulty from your end. But at the same time, that all these kids are sponges. So you know, they are they're, sponges. They're, they're running loops around all of us real quick. <laughs> they they are sponges. And I think that we're more responsible for creating the opportunities and ensuring that they have them, like that they have the experiences than we are how up to date in this thing they are, because we're trying to at least allow them to have exposure to these different tools that are available to them. You know, I mean, if you take a screwdriver, I'm sure there's somebody creatively, it's a one you know, one piece tool machine and, you know, <laughs> simple machine that, you know, you can use in a variety of ways. And if you go on to uh, social media, there's someone has found a unique way to use that thing that you've never thought of before. And that tool has been around for a really long time. So I don't think that it'll ever get old learning about something at its base where it starts and then and you just could you're just growing on that opportunity but if you've never seen or used the screwdriver before that's the problem 
So we're giving scholars those screwdrivers and we're actually giving them a toolkit with lots of simple tools in it. And they're taking those tools and they from those tools in their kit, they can build. Isn't that awesome? Oh, yeah. One of the questions I have actually is from the non-tool perspective, but almost the really the ethics responsibility, whatever word you want to use. But there's one in particular because of the connection to the arts, specifically at, at Campbell. How are you addressing, if at all, just the concept, maybe probably without name, of copyright and understanding that like you can't use, you know, this stuff is being based on other people's stuff. And we're, I mean, we don't even have a, a set yet, right? I, I'm not sure where I fall down on just the concept of, well, on one hand, you're like, yeah, it was trained on all these pieces of, of other people's material. And how can you, you know, how can you not pay them? On the other hand, I'm like, well, that's how I learned to write. That's how I learned to do any sort of art is by seeing everything. Am I supposed to pay everybody that I've looked at their piece of art ever to give me inspiration? I'm, so how are you starting to address just those concepts? Thank you. I'm going to, and Mr. Beasley actually was teaching. I mean, Mr. Beasley, you speak today. Yeah, I mean, I knew when I conceived of how we would approach this, and I thought I knew that this would come up, right? And 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 I thought it was something we could really focus on the issue of, especially of you know how are these AI being trained, right? Of the generative AI, where are they getting these images that they're training on, right? And that's a, a particular issue, but without getting into the nuances of copyright, U.S. copyright law, which I actually have experience talking about fair use in education and I used to do that for my video literacy work. We talked about copyright fair use and really arguing that you did have you could use these things yourself as a creator and that you should be able to uh, and learn, right? You learn by copying a lot. So without getting into copyright law, I did, you know, I we I I knew that this would come up. So but I kind of set it up in a way there's another layer to how I taught the lessons, which is that I did it in character. I was I took on the role. It's called teacher and role. This is a drama-based strategy that we use in creative action. Um, so I I took on the role of a tech entrepreneur, inventor, AI scientist person named Josh M. Bags, who kind of I changed. I did a quick change and I came in and I pretended to be in this character. And I said, I, said, I flew in from San Francisco and I need your help training my AI. And, uh, and so that was the setup. And it gets people, it gets everyone excited in this device. But I also knew that as we would go into creating and training this AI, that I would kind of reveal like where it's getting these images from, which is, I said, yeah, we're scraping the internet of all the images, everything made by artists and photographers. Your Instagram photos, we took those. And then that was when, when I said that, they were like, oh, hold up, hold up, wait a minute, wait, you're saying you've got on my, my Instagram, yeah, we just take it. And they're like, oh, you know, that's when they, they, they know that you can't just take people's stuff. Like, you don't have to know the nuances of copyright and know, front law to know that there's something wrong with taking somebody's stuff. And that's something that, uh, you know, a third grader understands, like, I'll take my stuff, right? So that's how I kind of problematized the, the whole thing and then opened it into conversation. I'm like, oh, well, what is wrong? Rather than me tell them that, oh, this is wrong. What are the issues around this? Is this, is this okay? Is this right? What, what are the problems? Who's impacted by this? And just using those questions to, to let them think about it, to let them make, discuss it and decide how they feel about this and whether it's right. And they had great responses, like in third, fourth, and fifth grades. They really, they had a lot of really nuanced ideas um, to say about that. Yeah, so they so solve it for us, or we got to still wait for the Supreme Court case uh, to solve it? I, <laughs> I think they solved it. No, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll let the yeah, we'll let the lawyers sort some of that out. Yeah, but um, but for the themselves, they they knew it was an issue of consent, and they yeah. and we use that language like around photography. So. So they understood that if, if you don't have consent for them to use your art or your photographs, it's probably not. That's right. Whatever the law is. Yeah. One of the, little, the scholars said uh, jokingly that they were going to sue Mr. Beasley for using in their, <laughs> using their images. <laughs> that was so funny. I'm going to sue you. Uh -huh. yeah. like, 
I was like, I, I gotta did. get out of here in character. <laughs> I remember doing a mock court thing on uh, it was like the John Brown trial and of the Civil War, like the you know, as as a kid. And there's a lot of learning that comes from that. I think it could be. I don't think I. One of the things I think in education, I feel like, and I'm not alone. Is that the the idea of simulation and doing these things out? We've kind of lost a little bit, and so. It might be an interesting, now it might be a little bit much for like third graders, but uh, fourth graders, but as you're getting a little older, like, great, sue him and let's play that out. What would the, what would the arguments be? And what would they be really, I think, interesting conversation that would, would go on? Yeah, no, I uh-huh. agree with that. It would be awesome to have a lot of time uh, in the school day to, to do those kinds of extensions that would really support learning in that way too. Well, and I think it's a trials, good, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's a great shift though, because we hear a lot about, you know, AI, and I kind of wanted to to kind of go up to like three thousand foot little. AI is transforming education, right? Everything from the whole question of cheating and how do we define cheating to the ability to create personalized tutors to just the complete reworking of the educational model. I mean, does this current structure really form in with this? So I'm going to ask a little bit of prognostication here. Where are you seeing the convergence of education AI going next year and in 10 years from now? And I will hold you to this. <laughs> You're going to come back in 10 years and answer, I'm back a decade later. Aha. <laughs> That's, I, it's all on record. We're going to come back and see, let's see where you were, right? Ooh, so I'll tell you what, uh, because AI is not something that just jumped up overnight, but it has gone. So once it was here, it just, it's nonstop. You know, I don't think that, that anyone will be able to, because in 10 years, I mean, I guess the, it's a double-edged question because will, will people still be using AI technology in 10 years is the question. Yeah. What, what will it be replaced with? Because at some point it came and got, so my, my, my answer is going to be what will have taken over for AI at that point. 10 years is a long time. Do you see, given just in the, I mean, you've been said like the time to do mock trials and some of this, do you see our current educational structure and ped, uh, uh, ped, way of doing it? I can never get to that word right. Uh, Pedagogy. Um, mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Starting to really shift just given the new tool sets that we have available. I don't know if I if I see anything shifting because like core curriculum uh, is in the state of Texas. We use our uh, the TEKS or the TEX as you want to call them, and it's the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. And so those are like it highlights exactly what in each grade level scholars should be learning and what opportunities, what uh, expect student expectations there are for scholars at each grade level. So I think that as the educator then I'm more responsible for taking that core that is the, the, like, this is what they're supposed to be learning. How do we use these tools to make this more relevant to the scholar or to make this more up-to-date or contemporary with regard to, you know, what they're going to experience in real life, but they still have to learn the same core. You know, that's, you know, the reading, writing, everything else. But and so there won't be I don't see time being spent on like you take away time. You're not going to take a math block and now have this be something else. But I certainly see smart educators uh, partnering uh, if they aren't able to do it in the in-house themselves, partnering with organizations like Creative Action who can help to take that work forward by making those, making the most of those minutes, those instructional minutes that you already have and looking at what your core instruction is supposed to be and how do you enhance that? Do you run a copy and give them a worksheet or do you pull in some of these amazing tools that in all of this technology and and things that are happening around us to to encourage scholars to learn in those ways? So part of the origin of this, you said, is like, you know, you knew creative action. It was close by. One of the things now I've only been here for three years, but I've noticed that the experimentation in the education market, for lack of a better term, in Austin is really interesting, right? We have groups like Creative Action. We have new, you know, private schools coming up to create entirely different paradigms. We have new universities being created. So there's all this experimentation that is going on 
in education, education technology, how we do these models here in Austin. Any particular reason or sense of why the city and the region is becoming such a hub for this particular vertical? Well, uh, I mean, Austin is a melting pot. You know, I'm like, I'm a unicorn. I'm a native Austinite. And I actually still live here in Austin, you know, and but but we're I think we're blessed. It's it's a blessing and a curse. You know, I mean, if you want everything to be the same, look the same and always remain the same, then maybe you're bummed out that that our, Austin has a wide variety of folks coming in from different places. But accepting that it is a melting pot, I think that we're folks come in looking for things that they had where they came from. If I had this certain thing at home, I'd like to bring that to the gumbo. Oh, well, I did this at home. Let's bring that to the gumbo. There are so many fresh faces here and for new cultures and opportunities here. It's so diverse that, you know, you kind of want to make sure that you, you're you welcome in that. It can only be better, you know, we can only be better for it by allowing everybody to to contribute and, and bring what they know and what they're experienced in to the table. So the, the, the tastes change too, because, you know, if you're coming from somewhere else, then you're looking for reminders of home or things that you thought were amazing about where you are. What was great about education where you were? Those are things that folks look for when they come here. If you don't see those things, then you want to see how you can help make those things a reality here. And things that you do see here that are similar, they comfort you and you want to be a part of it in that way. So there's just so many opportunities to highlight scholar success and, and uh, increase academic outcomes through um, just sharing and learning together. One of the things that I think about is education and the regulatory structure that comes along with it makes it generally, and I'm speaking generally, hard to initiate experiments, hard to initiate change in anything. One of the things you kind of see that broadly in Austin and in Texas is the more openness to those kinds of changes. You've seen that in we can build, you know, physical construction a lot faster here. You see like the, you know, the Gigafactory and the, you know, the Samsung fab that are coming up. Are you seeing that same on the education side? It's funny. I just I, I asked this be specifically because I've seen when coming from California, the idea of trying to incorporate new technology into curriculum was like this really long process and this really complicated and it had to get all these sign-offs and here like yeah well mr beasley we should do this so go do it it's like that, that that seems quite fast to me and i mean that in the best way possible yeah. so well however you mean it i'm gonna tell you like i i accept that because you you won't really move your work forward if you're waiting on someone else to move it for you. I really believe that to my core. And so I'm I'm the person, I love to be a trailblazer. I love to be somebody who's the first one to do it. And maybe there were some mistakes in it, but guess what? We are going to get those things together and make it even better. But I'm, I'm not afraid to, to do that. And I think having a partner a uh, partnership that says, hey, you know what? If you you want to do, okay, you're leading this, but uh, we'll jump in and, and go with you. And, 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 and we do it, you know, and I think you hear sometimes that, you know, someone said, um, I don't know who the person was, but they said that sometimes it's easy to just apologize, you know? And, and so if we, if we go wrong somewhere, uh, it, we, we're never taking uh, risks that, that are damaging to scholars. But we are always taking risks that are moving this work forward, you know, and it's not just about AI or about digital media. It's about anything that we're doing towards scholar success, creating access for scholars. And we can't be afraid of how someone else will some naysayer may feel or, 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 you know, or not feel about us moving the work forward. That's creating access for scholars. That's the mission. You know, we want scholars to have the most that we can give them so they can be the most equipped and the most prepared. And we can't do that if we're not. I don't work for adults. I work for children. I don't have there's not a single adult that I work for. I work only for children. Those are my employers. So I keep that in mind. And what is, am I doing right by them if I'm not giving them everything that, that they need or exposing them to as much as I can expose them to within reason, you know, age appropriately, that um, that is for them? 
things that I know they may not get otherwise. I can't wait for somebody else to say, hey, let's try to give it to them or, hey, maybe it would be a good idea. If we know that it can't harm them, we want, what are we waiting for? Let's do it. Oh, I, I love the attitude. I love the the risk taking and all of it, which, which of course, that's why when I first heard about the school, I was like, yes, I want to have you guys on and, and talk about this and what's going on here. Well, this has Good. been a I lot of fun. you're hiring because I may be looking, you can be hiring. I may be <laughs> when this pocket. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's so much support uh, in Austin ISD for uh, creativity in different ways. And, and, you know, Austin is a creative community. And so I think for, for anything else, people embrace creativity and the opportunity to do it. It's just, an, it's more work. It's a different job. It's an additional, it's, it's not a this or that, it's an and. So I am increasing my workload by doing this without, there's not an additional pay tied to it. But if, if I really believe in here, that that's the right thing to do, then I have to work from here and make it happen, you know? From the, from if you believe it, you have to work from the heart to make it happen. I, I say all the time, one of the superpowers of Austin is we leverage the power of and. There you go. So I think this is a perfect place to kind of wrap up, and we always end with the same question. So, Mr. Beasley, why don't I start with you, and then uh, Principal Moore, I'll give the last word. What's next, Austin? What's next, Austin? I, I, what's next, Austin? That's such a big question. What's next at Lee Lewis Campbell Elementary and using these AI tools? I have thought about that. So what are we going to create next year? Uh, how are we going to use these tools next year? I'm already getting some ideas. I'm thinking about like, how can we use like AI generated backgrounds in to make short films, right? Where we can, we can do a green screen and have these backdrops anywhere. And I had a, a colleague, a teaching artist, who just made a science fiction film with his after school group where they used AI backgrounds and, and combined with them and their handmade paper and foil and cardboard costumes and spaceship consoles. And it looks amazing. So we can use these. How can we use these tools to tell stories, to uh, use our imaginations, uh, as well as explore issues of how we create, how can we create things together, you know, and in these tools that are often made for, individual use and individual expression, how can we use them collaboratively? How can we use them um, in partnership with other people? And that because those kind of soft skills are always going to be in demand and always be needed. And again, like how can I want to make sure that the scholars here at Lee Lewis Campbell Elementary are having access to that learning as well. Love it. Principal Moore? Well, um, so Austin next folks, you want to know What's next, Austin? Well, what's next is you will leverage your social media and influence every listener uh, right now to follow our Instagram, which is the Dragon Leader. The Dragon Leader, three words all together, and also Creative Action. That's their handle as well, Creative Action. And so you'll do that. And what will be next? That's where you'll find out because you'll continue to follow us and you'll encourage others to come. Now that you've experienced kind of like what we're doing on our campus, you'll be able to tell others about this and what creative ways that we're helping scholars access their core curriculum that's state mandated in such creative ways. And that's for grades uh, pre-K four, meaning four year olds all the way up to fifth grade. So what's next, Austin? greater opportunities for scholars through increasing the use of technology in these wonderful ways to connect core curriculum to the arts. I love it. Principal Moore, Mr. Beasley, thank you so much for joining Austin Next. Thank you. Stay dragon strong. Pleasure. So what's next, Austin? We're glad you've joined us on this journey. Please subscribe at your favorite podcast catcher. Leave us a review and let your colleagues know about us. This will help us grow the podcast and continue bringing you unique interviews and insights. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.